Well, well hopefully Carrie will filter in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, Sarah, I was saying, I was telling Becky and Bridget, Mary Eames won't be here tonight. Yola, Fred's aunt, um, is still at Woodview, and she texted me about five o'clock to say she was still late. So, um, and they're visiting now, they're maybe like 10 to 6 or something like that. So, um, so she won't be here. But, but anyway, um, I've got a few prayer requests tonight. Um, obviously, to continue to remember Audrey's family, Tom, Don, Mary Jo. Um, Remember Viola and Brett and Mary as a, a difficult situation for all of them, but, but Mary did say she was improving. They hope that she'll come home in the next week or so. Um, and then also to remember Shirley Lloyd, whose daughter Debbie passed away um, Monday, but no, Tuesday. It's all running together now, Tuesday. It was either I saw the night, obituary in the paper. In the Mary. night or early in the morning, something yeah, like that. Yeah, Tuesday. So Shirley's doing okay. There will be a service for Debbie on the 26th of this month and Saturday um, at Brooks Lawn um, at 11 o'clock. Um, and then also Lois McCullough, also at Woodview. Um, not quite sure yet what the duration of that stay will be. Uh, Lois, her heart went into AFIA, which same thing happened at the end of October or uh, November. Medication resolved it then. Um, this time, medication they, medication hasn't gotten her, allowed her heart to get back in the rhythm, I guess. Um, they tried to shock her heart back in the rhythm last week, maybe last Tuesday or Wednesday. Um, worked for a few minutes, but then went right back into APA. She also has um, congestive heart failure. So um, they were able to draw pretty considerable amount of fluid off and around her lungs <clears throat> last week at the hospital and she felt a lot better after that. Um, but she's every day, one day she's up and one day she's back. So it's just kind of a hard situation. Just continue to remember her and that she can be encouraged especially to be um, and then Larry Jennings too. I think Carrie Pate had a death of her family. Yeah, yeah, that was another thing. Yeah, Carrie, uh, she actually had an uncle that passed away. They had a funeral for him last week. Uh, but then Carrie's first cousin, 29, uh, that they found him dead. He was in a hotel room for work. You know, whatever they did, they traveled. So they found him dead. But the belief was from over there. Um, Dad, he had three children, nine and below. Um, he was supposed to get married in May to the mother of his two younger children. Um, so she said they were always devastated. She said that the kids had grown up with his kids because they were kind of the same age, so like family gatherings. That you know, it was a, a really hard situation. Woman. Um, Poor woman with her children herself now to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Not they are not getting to know Can I mention one more prayer request? Yeah. Hopefully it won't happen, but um one of our one of our sons-in-law is um army and he's in the 82nd airborne. Oh and he also has extensive training in Russian and so They've already sent a lot of the 82nd Airborne over to Germany and Ukraine. So just prayers that that stuff gets resolved and that he doesn't have to go. So is he still here? What's the He's right still here right now. Mm -hmm. well, certainly, I know that's a stressful. Yeah, he has a seven month old baby and yeah. our daughter and we just got married in 2020. So. And he, he's based out of Fort Bragg. He was at Fort Bragg <laughs> and Right now, he's at Fort Carson, Colorado, but he's actually not even there right now. He's in Florida Keys. Well, he's at Ranger School, right? That he's going to go to Ranger School as well. He's already finished Green Beret, and he's doing um, what they call dive school because the Army has a unit just like Navy SEALs that does stuff, yeah. marine, underwater stuff. 
And so he finishes that on the 19th of this month. And so hopefully he won't be one of those yeah. guests that should over there. So if it gets resolved. Yeah. But there's nothing else. Let's, let's pray. Most gracious God, we thank you for this day, um, Lord, and for the beautiful sunshine that you've given to us, Lord. We just, Lord, pray for all of these requests that we've named and we lifted up to you, Lord. We pray especially um, for the family of Aubrey Pender, for Tom and Mary Jo and John, Lord. We just give them strength and comfort uh, in these days, Lord. We just remind them uh, the great love that they had for Aubrey and the love she had for them. We just let them enjoy the many wonderful memories they share with us. Um, God, we pray for Carrie Tate, Lord, and her entire family, Lord, as they experience this unexpected and tragic loss, Lord. We just pray that you be with the uh, mother of the children, Lord, that you would give her comfort and strength and guidance, Lord, during this difficult time. Lord, we just pray that there would be many people, family members and friends and people from the community who would Surround her in love and support her through this difficult time, God. We pray for Yule and Holly, Lord, and for Fred and Mary, Lord, to continue to allow Yule to heal and build up strength so she can go back home, Lord. We pray for Lois and Cullen, Lord. We just pray that you would encourage her, Lord, that you would give her an appetite to eat, to build up strength, Lord. We just pray that you continue to be with the doctors and nurses who treat her the Lord today, that you would give them wisdom and guidance to figure out what they need to do to help um, get her heart back into the Lord. We also pray for Shirley Lowy. Lord, we can only imagine how difficult this week has been for her, the loss of a child. Lord, we just pray that you would encourage her, Lord, that she would feel your presence in her life and be reminded of her love in a real way. Lord, we just pray that as her church family, Lord, we would support her and encourage her and lift her up in prayers. Lord, that we would live out your love um, towards her. God, we pray also for Larry Dennings, Lord, as he continues his treatments for cancer, Lord, that you just give him strength and rest and give his body healing, Lord, and just let him know that he is loved and cared for, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for Sarah and Bill's son-in-law, Lord, and for the daughter as well. Um, Lord, that you would just give them peace during this difficult time, Lord, and we just pray that if it's in your will, Lord, that he would be able to stay here, stay inside, and, and to be able to be with his family, Lord, and we just pray for resolution, Lord, much of all for peace um, in, in this crisis, Lord, in, in Russia and in the Ukraine, Lord, that you would just let calmer heads prevail, Lord, that we would um, be able to avoid conflict and, and, and war and, and the loss that will come again. Um, God, we know that there are so many families um, here and, and that part of the world and really spread all over Europe who are experiencing similar situations tonight, uncertain as to whether their loved ones will be sent, um, Lord, to fight in a war. Lord, we just pray that we would be able to avoid that, Lord, and that God, Lord, we would be with all of them. And um, God, and we just pray that we would be with our church. Lord, and many members, there are so many people who are sick and hurting and just going through difficult times. We just Pray, Lord, that you would uh, allow us and, and, and challenge us and call us to be the church that we need to be in this time for our members, Lord, but also for our community. God, we pray that in all things we, we do, we would seek to be faithful to the calling that you have placed on our lives, Lord, the calling to get beyond ourselves and to share the good news of your son, Jesus Christ, the life and forgiveness we have found in him. And God, we pray especially for... Um, Guidance, Lord, as we seek to be a church that's more welcoming and warm for young people and young families, Lord, that we would um, seek to prioritize them and all the things that we do, Lord, that we might reach the next generation with the good news of your gospel. And God, we pray all of these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> tonight's chapter um, is all about kind of being. Like what is it? Be the best neighbor. So, so essentially getting beyond the church and out into the community and, and even beyond the community to the world um, to meet needs and, and to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Um, so I thought it was an interesting chapter 
Um, <clears throat> I thought it had a lot of neat ideas in it and things that, that we could talk about, but I, I just wondered, were there things that stood out to me? Well, let me let me say this first of all. Um, there was a sentence at the, near the bottom of um, 235, so the second page that I thought was kind of a good. That's right. I, I was talking it. about it, another. I marked church. it as well. We uh, but I marked the like same good, thing. I thought it was a really good. Like I think this should be something. Like if this was said of our church from our members. But also, like, if this was the impression that we could create, the witness that we would have in our community, um, I, I can't imagine like a better testimony, maybe, of the church. And, and what I said was that um, I did not need to be looking for Jesus or a church to find them. They were out there doing their thing, as opposed to a lot of churches that try to get you to come to their events in the church building. And that's exactly what I have. And I highlighted it and I'll put good point. Yeah. And uh, right up of that chapter, I mean, the paragraph above that, a church for the city, I highlighted that little phrase because it wasn't like you have to come to us to be a part of us. We're going to come out to you in lots of different ways yeah. in the community. And then, and probably, I think a lot of us need to be better sometimes at this is referencing First Baptist Church in South Boston. Yeah. Because if they, if you say like, oh, my church is doing this or I'm doing a book club at church, you know, I'm doing a book club at my church, First Baptist, right on North Main Street. In other words, make it, we, I think we should make it clear when we're talking to people who our church is. Yeah. Um, no, absolutely. Um, not just referring to my church this and my church that and my church and my church and my church yeah but saying what the church is because yeah. that might um pique someone's interest in being a part of a church that is reaching out or doing this for that group or oh i've, I've heard about first baptist weekday school um what a, tell me more about that you know you mentioned something and it can get a conversation. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah. You know, I thought um, I talked about this in the it was kind of like the opening part of my sermon so that about that the article I read about the survey where the pastors were concerned about people's apathy, right? And apathy is a strong word, like that's a very strong accusation of that church. Um, and I didn't say this part of the sermon, but you know, so I mean I, well, I did say part of it, but like so you know, I read that article. And I could very much relate to that concern, uh, specifically because, you know, like a lot of those pastors' boys, it's been very difficult. Um, and it, it was difficult prior to the pandemic, but it's especially difficult now to get people to volunteer to do things to help, you know, carry on the, the, the work of the church, essentially. So nursery workers, children's church workers, people to volunteer with you, the children, et cetera, things like that. That's been difficult. Um, but then, then I read that second article, and, and this is the part I didn't say in the sermon. When, when I first read the second article, in which the like the guy who is no longer a pastor, but has been a pastor for a long time, just was like very offended at the notion that like people would say that you know church members are apathetic. Um, when I first read that, I, I disagreed with him. Like I, I thought, you know, this is but his point, which I thought was, you know. I think part of the reason I disagreed with it so much was because deep down I knew he was right. Um, was that pastors tend to be most concerned with ministers um, about their church members supporting what the church is calling. I mean, I guess sorry, sorry, sorry it's complicated. Um, pastors want their people to be interested in the things that they're interested in, the programs the church can offer. And it's not that that's inherently a bad thing. Like we do need children's church volunteers, and we do need people in nursing. But he said that the problem, in his opinion, is that the church, for far too long, like the only thing that they had invited people to do, their members, the only way they had challenged them to live out this calling, was to get involved with things going on in the church, right? And that they had, for a long time, neglected the fact that all of these people, everyone in your church, in one form or fashion or the other, 
has something that they're passionate about, whether it's their profession, whether it's where they're at, like the state of life, a parent, a grandparent, um, something like that, or, you know, they, they have some, we used to call them affinity group, you know, things that it was like kind of their domain in the world. And that if pastors would spend more time, churches would spend more time helping affirm that calling that people have Monday to Saturday, the rest of the week, equipping them to live out their faith and to answer their calling to share the love of Jesus Christ and to tell people about Jesus Christ during you know the rest of the week, that, that you really wouldn't probably have to worry about finding volunteers to take the church because you're going to reach way more people, right? Like it's just yeah, I guess the whole the long and short of it was that the problem wasn't that people were apathetic. The problem was that people like the church had become grown so inwardly focused that it had neglected this incredibly important part of the church's calling. And, and really, probably the most important work that it needed to do was to figure out how do we get our people to live out their faith throughout the rest of the week. Um, and, and I thought that was interesting in like reading this chapter too, because it seemed to be kind of the point this chapter was making. Um, and, and what I liked about it was that it wasn't just like one size fits all approach or anything like that, or that, you know, like it, it was really about finding out one, what are the actual needs of your community that, that, that you could be? What are your people passionate about? And how can you bring those two things together, right? So, um, I don't know, I just thought it was really, sorry, that was a really long aside, but. Um, I'll tell you something I thought of when I was reading it, talking about being out in the community and, and you know, it doesn't have to be that everybody has to be right here, but representing your church out. And one of my pet peeves is um, litter. Mm -hmm. It drives me crazy to see the amount of litter that people throw out of car windows. I think that's most of it. They're just tossing it out of windows. And um, there's one street in particular you think that drives me crazy. And if you know where, <laughs> um, or probably crazy, past your house on down to where Barbara Street, which is where I live, hits um, what is the street that comes from um, parties up to? Oh, oh, oh. Ed Edmonds? Edmonds. Okay. Then one street further uh, is the one that goes down by the funeral home. Yeah. Yes. Maybe it's Webster. Mm -hmm. Webster Street has the worst litter of anywhere. Oh. I don't know why, but it's just tons on the side. And when we drive down there, because sometimes if we're going somewhere, if we just go down one block and go down, you say like five blocks, if you were to go down Edmonds to reach to there. So we go down one block on North Main and then take a left. And um, it just drives me crazy. And, and when they have some of that litter pick up in April or daytime or whatever it is, I'll usually go out there and you know wear something bright. And I have one of those little things that you hold in your hand and it does this. Yeah. And it, Put it in your bag, and and um. But I thought, oh, wouldn't it be nice? I wish we had some sort of First Baptist, like bright color, orange or red or something, a First Baptist T-shirt, big sizes that just stayed here, and you could put them on over your clothes, and then you took them off. And somebody washed it, you know, volunteered to wash it and kept it here. But so you were bright. And okay, you can't miss me on the side of the road if a bunch of us are working together. And um, and it said First Baptist Church South Boston or First Baptist Church North Main Street, whatever it says, you know something. And you get a lot of people together to do it. So so your bright shirt is keeping you from hopefully being yeah. hit by anybody going down the street. But you've got something. So you're not having to touch it by hand when you use those little things. You just have your bag. And you just like, even when I just go like circle around for like two blocks down and over and two blocks back, I come home with a grocery store bag full. Yeah. And I thought, oh, if we just spread out on a street like that on a Saturday or off whatever, an afternoon even, what we could pick up, but we also would, from those drugs, but 
would notice. And if you did it another time, I think you just did it once a month and had different people volunteering different times. Yeah. You're doing something for the community in our neighborhood within a mile's radius. You could do it different places, different times. But you're also making clear who you are when you're doing it. And nobody has to put their hands on it if you have those little, yeah. cute little grippy things like I have. But I think something like that, it, it doesn't require a whole lot of planning. And even just doing an hour, everybody doing one hour, or an hour and a half, you would get so much collected, it would probably blow your mind. Oh, yeah. But it's just something like that. I thought we could do something um, simple enough like that. And like I say, the t shirts make it clear who you are. If somebody was interested in who was doing that, and we could do a lot to improve our community in the simplest way possible. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's good. I'll quit ranking on that now. No, 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 no. <laughs> we had a uh, we had Ryan Madison Green for we used to have so we had the talking program we didn't tell parking people who didn't want to be hit by the car. So exactly you've got to have a bright shirt on something that just took people notice you. Well, what else from this chapter stands out? They talk about this was on page 238 at the top, keeping their church relevant and the pressure on young people to conform to popular cultural norms. You know, that was something that they talked about. Um, if you're talking about growing your church young, you know, you want to attract lots of different people and everybody should not look the same in your church. Yeah. Um, and, and that way people know. You want them to feel comfortable. If they don't look like everybody else, you still want them to feel comfortable. And the more comfortable you make them feel in front of the other people who might not look like everybody else, whether it's age or whether it's race. Yeah. Um, but I just I just think that some little things like that just sort of reminded me of, of wanting to reach out to make the church more um, having more variety in ages. You know, the one thing we want more of, obviously, are young adults because they have children that become a part of the church and then they grow into adults. Like when I started coming to the church was after I, my older daughter might have been like three or four or something like that. And she's 42 now. Oh. And I had the second one while I was here. A part of it, then she's 38 right now, 36, or 84, whatever that means, probably 36, going on 37. Um, and so I, I was one of those young adults who started coming at that point because I grew up elsewhere and then moved here and drifted around to a lot of churches and didn't go to church a lot because I couldn't find one I felt utterly happy with. Yeah. And then a good friend in the theater with me, a, a woman, an older woman who was um, active in Halifax County Little Theater, who was in the choir, said, come sing with us in the choir. And that's what brought me in to First Baptist. Mm -hmm. um, but then everybody was very welcoming and, and very comfortable. And I mean, you know, and it just, it just, I just liked it so much. I like, I love the music program that we had. I like the minister at the time, who was Mr. Bench, if you, yeah. if you yeah. heard of him, Kurt Bench. Um, you know, it was, uh, it just ended up being a good fit that somebody got me here. Yeah. I, it, I mean, I had drifted in and sat through a service, but, you know, it was okay with whoever was there at the time. But and it actually, was a friend. It confirms your point, though. As a friend, it's something here. that you did with your life the rest of the week, being involved in little theater and music, and then a friend who was also in little theater uh -huh. and liked music that said, oh, there's, you know, a good program exactly. at this church in music, and that's what yeah. where the connection was made. Yeah, I mean, like, so, I, you know, this is anecdotal too, but like, I mean, it's my story, right? Like, the reason my family ended up in church, the reason I'm sitting here today is because there was a lady exactly. that, you know, recognized that when she went into her, like her daughter's classroom, just to volunteer to eat lunch with her, 
that like she had an opportunity mm -hmm. to get to know her daughter's friends and to invite them to church. And like she had something that she believed in so passionately that she felt compelled to share it and like felt empowered to share it because the church had encouraged her to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and that, you know, that was like, I think that that's really, um, I was shocked. Like I, in seminary, I took a class that was for like youth ministry and, and it talked a lot about, um, in, in, in theological terms, you would call it vocation. So, you know, like people have a vocation, a call. Um, and so growing up in youth group, we talked about calling all the time. Like, you know, and, and granted, I felt all the ministries that was pretty natural connection. But like, I had felt like in high school, my church had helped me figure out my calling and explore it. So I thought that was normal. And even in seminary, out of like 25 people in the class, there were like two other people that had ever had a conversation in youth group growing up in church about calling, like that people have a calling, and not just ministry as a calling, but that like, you know, whatever you're doing in life, you, you have that calling, right? So whether it's, you know, through little theater, or whether it's through, um, you know, a job. a job, or whether, you know, you're retired and you play golf five days a week and you've got to know a bunch of guys at the club that aren't going to church anywhere. Maybe you go to a fitness class for a while. You know, exactly. you, you've got this we, mission field, so to speak. We all need to reach out more. And there's a lot of times I'm sure I could have said something that I don't always say something when I could. So we all need to try to be better at inviting. Yeah. And, and you might have to invite more than once. Um, because maybe it really doesn't suit them the first time. Yeah. Oh, I'm busy. We're going to be out of town that weekend or something. But invite again. Yeah. And again. And, and that's like know, other people. I did. Mean, I laughed and said, like, that's my story, right? So this lady, I mean, she had to invite me dozens of times to come to the to church. And I always just looked like, you know, I blew her off and she would come along and my mom would figure out some way to blow it off. Like, we just weren't interested. And, you know, most of the time, at least in my personal experience, like if you invite somebody to the same thing, there's a certain point where you just cut it off, right? Like, well, she just never gave up, right? So, like, she just never did. So, like, it was, there was always a standing invitation. Um, and, and she was going to be adamant about it. And, like, I finally ended up going to something and realized, like, half of my class was there, you know, like, it was just that was where my friends were. Um, and, and when, when I um, divorced, I stepped away from the church for a while because my husband was a Sunday school teacher at the time and I didn't want to make people uncomfortable. So I just, I went across the street for a while and I tried the Methodist church and I didn't like it. I mean, they were fun, but, but I still didn't have that comfort that I had here. And who brought me back was Audrey Pitt. Yeah. You know, you know I, I can ask a whole lot of that story because I remember you said it in like the, the last book club we were at and Mary Ace did the same thing, you know. Um and Audrey was and, and before Audrey took a turn for the work, we had it was a, like a Friday morning or something, and I was talking to her and I told her about the book club and I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, you know, and I think Did she remember that? Yeah, I mean you, you know how Audrey was. So Audrey was like very um deferential about it, you know, like, oh I'm glad, you know, I mean like I think she was trying to be she didn't want to be like most in her right life. exactly so she certainly but yeah i think you can tell like you really missed something to it, so. Um, so so somebody spoke out and made a point to contact me and got me back <coughs> i'm so grateful for that because this church means so much to me um but maybe i i probably wouldn't have if she had gone out of her way to contact me and say come on back come on back yeah. Oh, absolutely. I think the Wednesday night, the men that are meeting on Wednesday night is what this one of their main focuses or the focus of the whole group is learning and training to disciple people, yeah. to be leaders, not just in the church, but in the community on how to disciple people, but outside of these walls, yeah. because a lot of people are uncomfortable with it or they don't know what to say or what to do or think i'm going to offend somebody and or you know they just so you don't do it yeah. or if you do it's kind of half-hearted or you, you just kind of invite them to a thing that you think well that's not too um 
heavy, so it would probably be okay to invite them to this. And so, you know, I think it's great that there's a group of men that are oh, just like go for this. I think they're committed to, to it. Our congregation to speak up and share more, invite, invite more, and invite again. Yeah. Because that second time that might get them in. If no, you just say, if they don't come the first time and you say nothing else, then, you know, you're missing a chance. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's like, you know, part of what this chapter is talking about. So, like, I think, I think that's like maybe one part of being a good neighbor. Is recognizing and, and, and really thinking about who do you encounter on a regular basis, whether it's through a profession or you know uh, a hobby or an interest you have or anything like that, that you can invite to church, but also to like talk about this hope that you found in Jesus Christ that you know they need as well. Um, but I also think like another part of it is you know churches being faithful to really think about what's going on in their community, who's actually out there in their community, what are the needs of the community that aren't being met, what resources do the church, does the church have, and how do we get out there to meet those needs, right? Um, which I think, you know, I mean, just think about this church, like where we're at, where First Pres is at, where Main Street United Methodist is at. I bet you 50, 60, 70 years ago, the neighborhood the people that lived around those churches looked like the people that were worshiping in those churches on Sunday morning. Like it, it was reflective of the people, the majority of the people at least, who lived in the, you know, let's just say 10 block radius or 20 block radius of the church. That isn't the case today. I mean, there, there's still neighborhoods that are pretty close to these churches where a lot of members live. But that, you know, the demographics of this part of town have changed, I'm sure, a lot over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And the Main Street churches haven't really changed with it. You know, I mean, like, I mean, like we're not unique in that in any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, I'll tell us when I was in, when I worked for the Baptist Association in Brunswick, Georgia, so South Georgia, Brunswick's a larger area, so um, maybe things like Danville. Um, down like where First, First Baptist Brunswick was this huge church, beautiful, extravagant campus, you know, wonderful sanctuary, and 600 people on Sunday morning. It, you know, had been there for a really long time. You know, 50 years ago, all the prominent people in Brunswick, Georgia, lived right in that, that neighborhood. That was certain. I mean, where it was today, we did not want to be there after all. Like, it was the bad neighborhood. Um, but that you had people that would you know, living on the island across the waterway and it would come 20 minutes to go to church there. They, the church did nothing in their community. Like they didn't know their neighbors. Um, and what was interesting but tragic, there was a like a Section 8 housing community like three blocks from the church that had been built, you know, probably in the 80s. Um, the children's minister at the church, along with some of the, the college students, would go once a week and do essentially like a Bible study with the kids. They had like 40 kids from that community that would come. They, you know, give them a snack and it was a craft and a game. They, they built this wonderful relationship mm -hmm. with all of the children in that community. First Baptist had a Wednesday night program for children. The youth minister or the children's minister was like, well, you know, we've, we've gotten 40 more kids. Why not bring them? You know, they had a bug. They wouldn't pick them up. They were going to be a part of their children's program. It lasted like less than three weeks because the parents of the First Baptist kids did not want their kids around those other kids. So it was told to the children's minister that her options were don't bring the kids from the community or bring the kids from the community, but they need to have a separate program for the First Baptist kids. Just run two programs at once. Mm. It's a great, you know, I mean, it's a shame. It is, like, you know, it is. Um, but that, I mean, I think, unfortunately, like, for a lot of established churches, especially, you know, it might not be that quite of a drastic example, but like, they're not trying to meet their neighbors either, right? Like, you know, and there's something, there would be resistance to that, right? Like, I mean, I think if, if the people that live over, what is the, the street right before Irish, the Bernard? 
So yeah, yeah. Or I mean, you know, predominantly Shepherd Shepherd I mean, Street is probably what you're thinking. Yeah, Shepherd Street. Or like down on the street by the, the, the Jeffress. Jeffress, yeah. I mean, predominantly African American neighborhood. If we started, I mean, this how do you think our church would respond if one Sunday there's 40 or 50 African American people that don't look like us or you know aren't the same socioeconomic status as most of us? Would that be like would would, would our people be comfortable with that, right? I can, I mean, I, I don't think we would have some revolt, but like, I think there would be some interesting tension maybe we would have to live with for a little while. Um, but you know, I think that's the, why is it that way is what I, I would like to think about. Like, why, why do we have that resistance or that hesitancy or why have we not done more to get to know those families? I mean, talk about reaching families and adding young people, there's a lot of kids. I mean, if you go there about Shepherd Street, while the bus is in the morning, I mean, there's 30 kids out there probably. Um, there's, there's a lot of kids within walking distance of this church. Um, what, what's holding us back from like recognizing our call to go and reach them as well? Um, well what else in the chat? There's a, a little phrase that reminded me of something on page 245 in the last chapter. Um, it said, our youth pastor is better on saying, come as you are. And um, Sarah, do you remember when they used to have these things called come as you are parties? And oh, yeah. A group of friends would go out and they'd go to somebody's house and say, oh, come yeah. on, come on, you from And so they go, no, 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 let me know. This is coming to your party, you know. And you grabbed all your friends and you bring them in and, you know, they had food and fun activities yeah. planned. And you really just grabbed them and brought them in. And that's sort of like, that sort of is a fun thing to think of for you. Go grab a youth friend. I went to one in my room you know, <laughs> when I was in college. You know, so, so like, I'm going to come over, even if you say, I'm going to come over later tomorrow and take you somewhere, you know, be ready, you know. But, and then bring, everybody brings a friend. And if they've got a couple of fun activities planned, then maybe you get a few of them to come back again. And then maybe a few more might another time. But again, you're talking about growing. And sometimes you grow by a gimmick, but it gets them in and makes them see it's fun. Yeah. And I feel comfortable here. That was me. I'll come back. Um, and so we we need to reach out more. We yeah. need and sometimes it might be a gimmick that makes you reach out, but then they become comfortable and become a part of it. And um, like we're saying, like the youth come as you are party. But whatever can... I actually had marked the rest of that paragraph. Read the part. It, it makes it easy to promise our friends, this was up youth pastor and talking about high school kids, they won't be judged for not being Christians yet. Because it's it's like the reverse of what it ought to be. People should feel like they're coming to church to learn and grow spiritually and become a Christian. Instead, they think, well, I can't go because right. I'm not already one. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You, this, I'm not saying that very well. Right. No, 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 no. You're, you're, I'm, I'm you know not what a church I mean? goer. I, I, yeah. I, you know, I don't do that. My yeah. parents didn't make me go. Well, we used to talk about it, like in Georgia again, working with kids, like, you know, mostly inner city kids about like salvation and like being saved, like accepting Jesus. Like normally, the first, like especially older kids, the first thing they would say, well, I need to get my life right first, right? Like I'm just not, I can't do this yet. And like, you know, we're like, well, that, no, no, that's the reason you do that. Yeah, this is, you know, <laughs> this is exactly why you do need to make that decision now, you know, like that. Um, and, if, and if you flip the page to the, uh, to 246, it talks about um, what do you like asking one of the leaders, what do you think about this? Because I know they're not going to tell me what to think. Instead, they engage me in conversation. And through that, we can derive together the ways that we should live out our beliefs. More conversations, less conclusions. But it's, it's like you, you can get someone here to start a conversation or to start listening or to start meeting a few people. Um, 
different people. In other words, a lot of you would like to think your church have lots of different kinds of people, and they might not all be just like you. They might not be the same socioeconomic level. They might have different beliefs as far as um, relationships go. Uh, some might be divorced. Some might be long-term marriages. Some might never have married for different reasons. But that doesn't have anything to do with having faith and coming together and finding something similar and worshiping God and, and getting something from it and taking that back out in the community um, that you get them here and have conversations. They don't all have to be Christians to come here to begin with. Yeah, yeah. But that, that's your goal is just to reach out to friends and get them to come. And maybe they will down the road become that. Yeah. Yeah. It said, like, nevertheless, even though they don't align with everything in the church, they were made part of the church because they respect the process by which decisions are made. Through conversations at the end of that paragraph, we can derive together the ways we should live out our beliefs. More conversations, less conclusions. You know, so just getting them here one way or another, whether it's adults or whether it's young people. It, it's a it's starting a process you know if, if they were such wonderful christians already they probably are going to the church somewhere yeah. else so you're, you've got to reach out more than we probably and i'm speaking of myself too more than we reach out yeah invite 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 um well it's like that misconception you've seen the little blurbs where people Think there's a sign over the door that says only perfect people go here it's like <laughs> no that's precisely the opposite imperfect people go here and that's why we're here because that's we know we're point. imperfect yes you know and but people outside the church that are completely unchurched or maybe went a little as a child but never since have the misconception that they're not good enough to, you know, oh, well, I have done this or that in my life. Or maybe I'm currently am still doing this or that in my life. I, I'm not good enough to go to church. And they need to be told that's exactly why Jesus came, you know. There are so, so many people who have gotten out of the habit of going to church. And it's not just during the pandemic, all that's happened to some people. But even people who might have grown up in the church, but now they're 40 or they're 50 or 60, and they, for whatever reason, they quit going, and then it's just easy to keep not going. Yeah. And and so you, sometimes it might be a gimmick that gets them back or activity or something, but we need to do more to reach out and get them here once even, yeah. and then maybe that'll be twice. And there was something I was reading, I don't know if it was this week or previous, Sometimes it might take four to six weeks for someone to establish a habit. Yeah. You know, so, and if, and if they don't come the first time, then ask again. You know, let them know you still care. Try to get them another time, offer to pick them up. Um, but if we all try a little more, it might make a big difference. Oh, I think so, absolutely. Um, Sarah, on the um, the Women's Day that's coming up. Yes, the end of, end I'm of only month. mildly terrified. But. <laughs> and, um, You're speaking. Yes. <laughs> oh, you'll do fine. Oh, you'll do a great job. Um, there are three of the youth who are going to do a presentation of a poem called Where is God in the Pandemic? Ah. And um, one is Emory and one is. Rachel mm -hmm. and then one is Candace Green, who has been sitting over here and coming some with Matt Richards, part of the yeah. young life we work with. But she's been coming here for a couple of months now. I think I met her the other last yeah, week or whenever we served the family. Yeah. Maybe I think she's ninth or tenth grade. But I met her this fall. Uh, because she did the one-act play competition that Fred was doing in the high school, so I worked closely with her for several months. 
So I was tickled then when I saw her hair um, starting to come. So on the Women's Day Sunday, we have those three girls who are presenting this poem. The poem is not necessarily meant to be performed by three people taking individual lines and sung together, but um, you know, I'm not changing the poem, I'm just changing the way it's done to be a three person poem instead of one person. So we met, we're meeting for three Wednesdays to work on it before the Sunday. So we met this Wednesday. And um, they didn't even all know each other really well. They didn't really know Candace. So at least they're getting to know each other a little bit more too. But again, Candace said, I am so glad, I'm so excited to be doing something with the service. I want people to know that we're not just here to watch that we can be a part of the service also. And she, she had said something similar to me before, but she was so excited to be doing yeah. this more mm -hmm. as a part of the thing. And I'm just always big on public speaking comfort. And so, you know, what I'm helping them with on that can carry into speaking up if they have to stand up and give a report in school or they have to do something else. That, that feeling a little more comfortable because you've had just a little more training. And um, so I'm just real excited. We we had a good first mm -hmm. rehearsal and we've got two more. Um, They're going to do way on. And I want to talk to you later about maybe some microphones at maybe our last rehearsal. And I'll talk to you later about that. So they get the sense of practicing talking into a microphone. You can do it before you leave because I have to wait 10 minutes for this recording. We'll talk. Okay. We'll talk. Um. But again, if you get them involved in some way, then you. You give them a reason to want to keep coming back, whether it's adults or whether it's young people. And um, we need to, I, I like the way more people are involved in our service with someone speaking at the beginning and someone I like different people doing the scripture. Um, you know, we need to keep involving more people yeah. so they do feel apart. Yeah. Um, well, we've got five more minutes. Is there anything that really jumps off? Uh, let me see. Uh, I'm 254 talking about like avoid common pitfalls. I don't really know that I understand uh, the quote, the only way to change culture is to create more of it, like the creating more culture strategy or approach. I don't know that I can think of ideas as to what he means by that. <laughs> I think they're saying to to counteract, because two pages back from that, Bridget, I had marked um, trying to help young people away from hyper individualism and consumerism. All you have to do is look at social media to see that that's what is promoted every second of the day. So that's the culture that they're barraged with. And I, I took that to mean on 254, the only way to change that culture, the hyper-individualism and consumerism, is to create more of Jesus culture yeah. to make them Almost realize the that one is better than this one. Yeah, you know? I, I, I like to use the word better. Like I was gonna say, that I think what he's going for, it's really interesting because Andy Crouch is somebody who chooses words very carefully. And, uh, I've read several things that he's written, um, so it's interesting. But I think what he's going for is like the only way to change culture is maybe to create a better, a culture, better one. You know, so like he like, says, set aside an existing set of cultural goods right. for a new proposal. So when they come here and they feel like the the young man that said he took his girlfriend who had been Muslim and then agnostic and he took her to church and he thought, oh, she might be freaked out because it's going to be weird and different or might be too much. And she actually was incredibly moved by the service. And I think it said that she even cried. Yeah. And so to make kids feel like there is a different culture than what is being shoved in your face on your smartphone every day. There's a there's a better alternative. Yeah. 
And if they can feel that when they're around other Christians, um, you know, that aren't perfect, but that are striving, you know, to live as Jesus would have us live, then maybe they can begin to see, you know, there's another option. I and mean, it's like, a better option. Yeah. At the time, yeah. I like back to something Becky you talked about tonight too. I think for a lot of churches like ours and probably for this church, you know, there was up until a certain point when the community around us changed and jobs went away and there weren't many people. I doubt First Baptist ever had to get beyond its doors out of the community to, to, to reach people because it had this culture, this reputation and that there were enough people in South Boston that wanted to be a part of something like that, that they were going to find their way here, right? Like that was the culture. Like we didn't have to go out and find people. Exactly. They came to us. It's just like, you know, chances are, I mean, people always say like in marketing, like Apple, um, Apple tells you what to buy, right? Like, you know, they don't, they don't need to convince you that you want their product. Like if you've already bought into it, you're going to want, like it's, they, they, they've revolutionized marketing, maybe. Um, but they're like we're, we're in a different world today, right? Like, like for one, really good paying jobs and like you know upper middle class jobs. Even there aren't a ton of those here anymore. Or you know people that like the doctors at the hospital don't live in the community. A lot of them they they travel in. Um, we need a, a a better culture that allows us to better reach a community that's changed, and that culture needs to be that. We invite people to come, right? Like that we have good things going on here. We can tell those good stories, and that we can recognize that, that, that we have this responsibility, this calling to figure out who in our lives aren't going to church anywhere, could use the you know needs of relationship with Jesus Christ, and, and that we create this culture where if you're a member here, members here invite other people to come, right? And then like when they do come. Everybody is warm and friendly and like interested in them, and, and we figure out a way to communicate how grateful we are to have them here, and like we take a genuine interest in them. Right? I think our church does a really good job of going and speaking to people yeah. who come to visit, but you got to get the people who right. visit, yeah. you know. And like it says, sometimes um, being good neighbors through participating in local and local missions, volunteering inside the church, serving outside raking leaves for the elderly, volunteering in a soup kitchen, building houses, picking up trash in the city, exploring social entrepreneurship. Um, several of those things we can do if we just That's do right. it. And it, it, it doesn't make you commit to every Saturday morning. It might be one Saturday every spring or two Saturdays every spring or one in the summer, you know, one in the yeah. fall. But we could do that as a church Absolutely. just a few times a year. And if nothing else, if you wear those bright t-shirts, we're making a point that we care about the community and the environment and we're out serving. Yeah. And yeah, if nothing else, people see you and they think something hopefully positively about that. And the other thing about it too is it's one of the blessings of the world we live in now too, is that do things like that. And with social media, it's very easy to like. You, you know, tell the story. I mean, exactly. You know, it's, exactly. I mean, you know, it's another way to, get to, to create the impression that yes, we're a church, and yes, we worship together, and yes, we are committed to growing in our faith with Jesus, but we're also committed to serving our community, and that's a big part of who and we this are. This is what we were doing this Saturday. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, look, we are we are fresh out of time. Um, but I really Can I just say one last yeah. sentence? Yeah. Thirty seconds. Page. 265, which I thought was the main point of it all, right in the middle. What kids are told is you can be anything you want to be, which is true, but we should be helping them to discover what God has called them to do. And I just thought of you because that's what yeah. happened with you. Like, you know, every kid is told in America you can grow up to be president, and that's true, but. That might not be what God is calling you to do yeah. <laughs> is be president. So I just thought all of these things and ideas were quite good in this chapter, but I just, I would never want the church to lose sight of what, you know, the, what we're yeah. really supposed to be doing, which is, you know, helping them discover faith in Christ and, and God and doing what God leads them to do. So.
when I, I think an important part of that too is it like you know it, it talks about one of the other previous chapters is like taking Jesus's message seriously, right? And like like taking scripture seriously and like teaching scripture. And what I think is so compelling personally, and I mean I hope it's compelling to everyone too, about scripture is that it's this story, one big story with a lot of different parts, about God trying to share his love with God's creation. And that like people in the Bible play a part in that, you know, whether it was King David or whether it was Jeremiah or, you know, whether it's one of the disciples after the resurrection, right? Like, like they all play a part of it. And, and what's so compelling to me about scripture is that, you know, with the exception of Jesus, none of them were perfect people, right? Like they were, they made mistakes and some of them were like really, I mean, like Peter, I, I love Peter, but Peter was bonehead, right? Like he constantly made mistakes, but he was willing to try, right? And that, you know, like to me, that's what's so uh, like interesting and what I love so much about scripture is that I think that like, we can sit with it and recognize that, you know, we don't have to be perfect and that we can be flawed and broken. And, and, and the hope that we can find in scripture is that we're not defined by that, and that God wants to transform that, and God loves us despite it. But also that like God chooses to use us despite those imperfections we have to achieve this mission, right? Like, and we all have a part in it, right? And like God wants us to play that part, and God empowers us to play that part. And I think that's amazing, you know, like, um, um, I don't know exactly where I was hoping to go with that when I started that story, but um, anyway, that's where I'm at. So um, I just think, you know, that's when we talk about vocation, it is true you can be what you want to be, I guess, to a certain extent. You know, like I said, I'm kind of cynical for it, so I'm not sure that's always the truth. <laughs> um, it works out for some. But like, I think you're absolutely right. Like, it, what, like your what the idea church exists to do is that who you want to be should be who God calls you to be, right? Yes. And it just, you know, like your idea with wearing something, you know, bright that, that sets you apart. If somebody, you know, that's walking their dog and says, oh, you know, that's great what you're doing. Like, why are you doing it? Yeah. You know, somebody might say, why in the world would you want to do this on your Saturday? And we have to be willing to speak boldly and say, well, we're doing it because we love God's creation and we love this neighborhood and we love the people in this neighborhood and we want it, you know, that's why we're doing it. Yeah. Cause otherwise you could be like, well, cause I work for the town of South Boston and they told me to pick up trash today. You know, it's like, there needs to be the, the reason and the motivation. The why. Behind, the why. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. And don't they talk about the, Offering internships at the church. Is that anything we're doing again this summer? I don't, I don't know. Um, I would love to do it. Physically, I don't know that we would that. Um, be a lot harder to say it this year. Um, uh, but that's not to say we could. I, I think it would be, be a great Because like, I, I, for one, I thought Mary did a wonderful job. Yes. And um, I think it would be beneficial to Chastity and Matt, but the rest of the church too, to have somebody like that. I mean, that's a like personal thing for me too, because like I was, I had experiences like that when I was that age, but it deeply formative to me, uh, meaningful. So. And yeah. she she grew in her abilities. Oh, when she was here at her speaking abilities, especially I always listen to that. But she grew so much more comfortable the more she did. Yeah, absolutely. That was she was she was a very confident person. So, I mean, you know, like she uh, for her age, I thought she was. Yes. Yes. Um, so I thought that was. She did a one. Yes. Yes. Well, well, I, I, like I said, I really enjoyed the conversation. Like, we're going to plan to meet again next Thursday. Um, it's the final chapter of the book. Um, so we'll, we'll meet again at six o'clock next Thursday. Um, and then I'm probably going to take an indefinite break from book club because I got several other things that I would like to pursue. Um, a lot of which are based off of it. So, um, so, um, so yeah. But anyway, well, well, this um, you can close it out so he can end the oh, okay. thing if you want. <laughs> let's uh, let's pray. <laughs> Most gracious God, we just thank you for this evening, uh, Lord, and again the chance you've given us to fellowship together, Lord, and to talk about how we can be more faithful as individuals, but also the congregation uh, to reach out beyond ourselves, Lord, and to share this love that we have found in your Son Jesus Christ with others. 
um, Lord, because we know that it's a love they need as well. Um, God, so we just pray for boldness, Lord, as we go about our lives, as we encounter friends and family members and co-workers and, and, and people that we just see on a regular basis, Lord, that we would um, be faithful, Lord, to encourage them, to love them, but Lord, to invite them um, to the, the program, to the event, to the life that we have together here at Life Baptist. Lord. We just pray for boldness in that. Um, Lord, you have blessed this church so faithfully um, over the years, and we just pray that we would seek to be faithful to you in return. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.